Hi everyone, uh, we'll get started. Um, my name's Alex Roberts and thank you all for joining today. Uh, we're going to talk to you about public sector innovation systems and the lessons that we've got from our recent work with Canada, uh, which just came out with our report uh, a week and a half ago. Um, today we're going to try and tell a bit of a story around what we've been doing and why. Um, I'm not going to cover everything in the report, uh, and there's also a summary highlights document that you can also read, which is 12 pages, which gives you some of the key points. Instead, we're really going to try and cover some of the, the journey, uh, what we learnt, and what, uh, why we did what we did. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, my colleague Kevin uh, is on the chat function and will be monitoring the questions, so please feel free to, to add them there. Um, but to start with, uh, I'd like to pass to uh, Chad Hartnell at the Impact and Innovation Unit, who uh, helped commission this work and worked with us over the past year and a half to, to undertake this exploration of innovation in the Canadian context. Um, and then I'll go into uh, my presentation and then we'll go back to Chad for some comments and then open the floor to, to questions and answers. So Chad. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us this, today. Um, would you like to, to give a bit of context around this work and, and why on your side you wanted to start this process? Absolutely. And thank you very much, Alex. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here to have a bit of a discussion and, and uh, uh, talk things through uh, based off of the, the really good work that the OECD has done on our behalf. Um, we are um, venturing into, uh, I think, a very strong innovation uh, storyline across the government of Canada, and that's a, a bit of a culmination with some recent uh, um, investments and recent uh, decisions that have been made around uh, trying to put innovation into more of the, the work that we do as uh, the public service here in, in Canada. So in that context, uh, and understanding that this is uh, both a real uh, and disciplined and pragmatic approach uh, that we should be taking as bureaucrats in, insofar as understanding and undertaking uh, public sector innovation. Uh, we decided uh, probably about a year and a half uh, ago that we uh, wanted to better understand the innovation system uh, here within the federal public service. Uh, so as we look to understand that, it's always helpful uh, to, to uh, do a bit of a, a study around some of that, which was the initial, um, uh, I guess, foyer into uh, into talking things through with the OECD, with uh, Alex and, and his team, uh, and uh, and that can then be hopefully translated into better understanding the public sector uh, innovation ecosystem and help us to make uh, further uh, decisions and further. Um, sees further opportunities for how we can uh, bet both better understand and then uh, hopefully scale some of the, the work that is, is being undertaken. So that's just a very brief intro as to why we were uh, uh, so interested in this work. Uh, the, the real uh, gem in, in all of this, of course, is the findings uh, and the methodology that the OECD has uh, put into place over that period of time. Uh, and so, Alex, I think it's best to turn it back to you and uh, for you to go through uh, this very important work and uh, be happy to obviously engage in some discussion afterwards with participants. Thanks so much, Chad. Um, so, I'm going to start with a year and a half ago when we were meeting with the Impact and Innovation Unit and talking about, well, what is this? Uh, what should we do, uh, what's needed, and we started with, well, what did we already know? So we had lessons from other countries. For instance, the UK National Audit Office had done some work on the air innovation system back in 2009. I knew from my own experience within the Australian Public Service, uh, where we'd done a report in 2010 around empowering change, and looking at the, the public sector innovation uh, system in the Australian context. And we at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation also have an, a, an international network of people that we can draw on um, and we talk with about their experiences. There was also a lot that we knew from the Canadian context. There's been a lot of things happening already 
uh, over the years um, around reform and innovation. And we also knew quite a bit from innovation theory and practice um, from the private sector and also from the public sector. But there were still quite a lot of unknowns. One thing was very clear, though, from this work was that we, um, Canada certainly isn't new to the innovation story. There's been a long and clear history of uh, interest in innovation. And there's also been an articulated ambition for more innovation. There are some quotes here on this slide from uh, uh, two of the clerks of the public service from different points in time, which emphasize this point that there's been a, uh, a stated ambition for more innovation, that think more is needed. Um, and also, as we discovered, as we looked into the history more, there's also been an ongoing struggle to find the right balance between ensuring appropriate controls and opening up and allowing for change and innovation. And that's really because innovation is hard. Um, it's not an easy thing to get right, and no government around the world has mastered this yet. So it's about a question of, well, if the Canadian public service has already been innovating, um, and we clearly met many bright and passionate people within the public service of Canada, what's the problem? What more? Well, what we also know is that while governments have been innovating, it's not exactly been a consistent thing. It's more often been an ad hoc, reactive, opportunistic activity. When we live in times that require innovation to be a consistent, deliberate, reliable resource. Um, we know this because of a number of reasons. Governments uh, in an environment of change must also change what they do. There's also an element of governments have to run just to stay in the same place. In an evolving economy, governments have to change their policy settings just in order to maintain the same level of outcomes, unless they do things differently. We also know that innovation is not a spectator sport. It's something that to do, you have to get your hands dirty. You've got to have the experiential knowledge of innovation. We also know that public servants, citizens and governments want more. They want and expect things to change. There's also a real risk of a mismatch. A government that doesn't innovate is one that's at risk of always being behind, always reacting, yet forever disappointing. So innovation needs to be a core competency. Innovation is not going to be the only answer, and it's not always going to be the right answer. It's not something you always want to do, and it's not always the best thing to do. But increasingly, it's got to be one of the options that's considered. In, and therefore, innovation needs to be systemic. It needs to be repeatable, consistent activity, not something that happens in reaction to uh, particular circumstances. And if we want to be systemic about innovation, then we need to understand the underlying system. What is a system, though? I'm not going to run through a technical definition. I mean, there's a lot of different meanings and conceptions of this. But what I'd like to think is that it, a system is the things that mean that those in the system know what is expected without having to be told. It's all of those things that we know, um, we know what the appetite for public sector innovation is usually. We know what the standards are, the processes are, the protocols. We know all of those things, even though we don't necessarily have to be told. That's, that's a system. And what's an innovation system? It's the factors, components, and practices that affect whether and to what extent innovation occurs. So it's important to note there's already an innovation system. It already exists. It's just a question of whether we want to be more deliberate and explicit about that system to ensure that not only is innovation happening, but it's happening at the level that we want and expect. And as we've already seen from the stated ambitions within the Public Service of Canada, the answer is um, that level hasn't been reached yet. How then do we understand the system that does exist? 
Well, first we need to understand how we got to where we are. If we want to go somewhere different, we need to know where we've already been. So we have to start with understanding the beliefs in the system. What do people believe about innovation and why? And how did we get to there? What shaped those beliefs? We also need to understand what's already been learnt to test and validate and then extend that learning rather than replicating and repeating it. There's already been a lot of activity within the Public Service of Canada, for instance, and uh, um, a lot of things have already been learnt. We needed to build on that rather than just uh, repeat and emphasise it. Similarly, we need to understand the achievements that have already been reached and what building blocks are in place that can be utilised and uh, taken advantage of. So we have to understand the past. We also need to understand the lived experience. It's all very well telling people to innovate, but if we don't understand the realities of innovation, the context, we're not going to get very far. People operate in very different environments and we have to appreciate that and get a sense of, well, what is it really like trying to innovate? What does it feel like? What's encountered? What's involved? Uh, what works and what doesn't? And of course, we need to understand that all of the things that are in play. Now in the innovation space, it's a, it's a dynamic system. There are always new things happening. So that can be quite difficult. But we had to get a sense of all of the different activity that's occurring um, and how, how that might play out. So we really need to understand the past. We need to understand what it's like now. And we have to understand what's already being done. So in order to get the new insights that we needed in order to do something different, knowing that the Public Service of Canada has already been innovating, it's already tried a lot of things, we need to have a different approach. Now this isn't a typical OECD review because we don't have a, a set framework that we can say, yes, you've done, tick all the boxes, this means that you will be innovative. Innovation is always changing. It's an evolving practice. We can't just say, this is how you will be innovative here and now. So we undertook a design-led process. We really tried to understand that lived experience and get it inside people's heads. Because innovation is about the possible. And therefore, you really need to understand what people believe is possible. I should also note that this was very much a learning process for us. Um, I mean, I, I came from the uh, Australian Public Service where I'd done some related work. But when I got to Canada and we, we undertook the first mission and we undertook all of those interviews, uh, it blew up a lot of my assumptions. Um, so we really needed to, to de dive deep to get to the fundamentals, to really uh, make sure that we understood what was going on. Which is why um, we came up with a lot of preliminary findings, 28 of them uh, to be exact. Um, because we really wanted to test and understand the different elements that uh, were in play to make sure we really understood what was going on. And out of that, once we'd validated them with Canadian civil servants, uh, we identified four clusters of these findings. Um, now, some of these might sound a little severe, but it's about holding your, uh, how holding Canada to the, its own standard, to the standard that it seeks for the public service. And again, no one has got this right. Every country is still learning, and that's what we're here for. We're trying to help, as the OECD, collect those insights and make that journey a bit easier for countries. So to start with cluster one, what we saw was that there was a fragmented understanding around the who, what, and why um, around innovation. And what does that mean from a systems perspective? Well, the issue is that with innovation, it's inherently ambiguous. Innovation is a hard concept to get to grips with. It's a hard thing to define because it depends on the context in which it's seen. And that's always change, changeable. But the nature of the public service is 
that any rational person is going to concentrate on the agendas that are clearly understood and thus more easily tracked and reported on. Why would you spend time on something that is hard to define, offers very uncertain benefits, is hard to get to grips with, is hard to communicate, when you've got all these other agendas that are clearer, more pressing, and easier to show that you've made progress on or are delivering on? So innovation is always really going to come second unless there's a clear agenda. And that's what we saw from this first cluster of findings, preliminary findings. In the second cluster, it was around the issue that we see innovation very much happening in the public service of Canada. There are lots of examples and, again, a long history of innovation within the civil service. But it's tended to rely on the right person being in the right place at the right time rather than it being about the need or the opportunity and the merit of the ideas or the options on the table. So we saw that the barriers to innovation are not absolute. Innovation was happening, but the ability of individual people to navigate those barriers depended very much on their own experience, uh, their context and their, their skills, i.e. relying on, on a bit of luck rather than being a more strategic activity. Um, and that's not ideal. In the third cluster of preliminary findings, uh, we found that the public service wasn't necessarily well placed to take advantage of the innovation, innovative options on offer. And this is because the feedback loops in the public service tend to lead to investment in clearly understood options rather than the emergent. But that's problematic when demand shifts. You might have uh, refined and got everything right in one mode of service delivery, but then if there's a shift in expectations from citizens and government about what's needed or what's appropriate, you have to be ready for that as soon as it happens. And that requires investing and exploring in things much earlier, even when there's not a clearly articulated demand or customer for those things. So this clusters around is government currently built to invest in and take advantage of innovative possibilities when they arise? Then in the fourth cluster, we're looking around, you know, again, there was innovative activity occurring, but it's often something that was sort of side of desk. Um, it wasn't necessarily well integrated into the core practices of the Public Service of Canada. And that's very understandable. Innovation is about difference. The government is traditionally about replicating behaviours and standardisation rather than difference. So how can innovation be made regular and routine if it's still seen as something exceptional or something that occurs on the edges? Um, and I should note there's a, a lot more behind these preliminary findings, which you can find the background material on, on our website. Um, which includes a lot of the uh, sort of key quotes and sentiments that underlie and help illustrate some of these preliminary findings, if that's of interest. Now, out of those uh, preliminary findings, with quite a bit of work and, and thinking, we landed on four core understandings about the innovation system in Canada. So first, while there's definitely been uh, increased attention paid to innovation in recent years in the Public Service of Canada, the relationship with innovation is still a bit unsure and there's still uncertainty about what that relationship should be, i.e. what is the role and place of innovation? Who is expected to do what and when and why? The second uh, understanding was around that, again, innovation is happening across the public service but it's more often been a byproduct of other processes or of the determination on the part of key individuals rather than the quality or merit of an idea or the underlying need for innovation. So again, it's about innovation being reliant on the right person being in the right place at the right time or as a byproduct of key agendas rather than what's best for the system. The third understanding was that while government is certainly changing how it operates, and we saw shifts um, in how the public service is working, and there are new activities and new initiatives trying to achieve 
uh, changes in how the public service operates, there's still a mismatch between what can be done inside and outside of government, which risks a public service that's unsuited to its context. If there's too big a gap between what's experienced when you're dealing with government and what you experience outside of government, then that's going to lead to disappointment. Um, and that disappointment usually has bad consequences for the public sector. The fourth understanding was that the practice of innovation has certainly developed over time. There's, it's become more sophisticated within the Canadian public service, but it still remains a marginal activity and not viewed as part of core business or just the way things are done. So what do those mean? Well, from those four understandings, it helped us develop a model about the determinants of innovation, i.e. what are the factors that shape whether and how innovation occurs. And for this, we found it really useful to consider three levels of analysis. So you can see innovation as an activity at the individual level, one at the level of the organisation, and then at the system. And part of the value of this, uh, these three levels of analysis for us is that if you think about it and you think that the system elements aren't in place, then it means that innovation is being driven or pushed at an organisational level. And organisations come at it from a particular siloed perspective. They come at it from a partial perspective of their own agendas, their own priorities and their own crises. And if the organisational element isn't in place, then it falls down to the individual. Um, and that means that it's individuals having to push against a system, to having to go above and beyond to make change happen. And that's where we see a lot of innovation activity, not just in the civil service of Canada, but across uh, the world. It's a lot, it's quite often reliant on individuals having to make an exceptional effort for innovation to occur. And that's not sustainable. It's in, I mean, in some ways, it's important um, to, to celebrate innovation from the individual level, and that's where a lot of change will start. But we have to think about how can we make innovation easier and more systemic. And if it's reliant on the individual or it's reliant on particular organisations, then that's never going to be the case. It's never going to become a systemic activity. It's never going to be reliable and consistent and meet the, the needs of a changing world. So to illustrate this a bit further, if we take one of the determinants, i.e. there's got to be a reason for innovation uh, for it to occur, we can see how it manifests differently across the three levels of uh, analysis. So at an individual level, the reason for innovation is I've got my own motivation to innovate. It might be because I want to change things, I want to make a difference. It might be because I'm responding to a particular problem or it could be very varied. At an organisational level, that reason for innovation usually comes down to a particular problem that's trying to be addressed. Organisations replicate what they do, um, so they invest in, uh, they're only going to invest in innovation when it helps them address a specific problem. But at the system level, it's around clarity. There has to be a clear signal for innovation, for why it's wanted, for why it's needed. Now, those are some nice words, um, and we've got a pretty chart there, but what does it really mean? Well, it's helpful to compare with the private sector. It's not to say that we should be like the private sector, that the public service should be like the private sector, but it's to illustrate the different structural forces at work and how that results in different behaviours between the public sector and the private sector. So, for instance, if we take clarity, in the private sector, there's a very strong, clear signal being sent all the time to people and participants, and that's profit. But if we think about uh, the public sector, that signal is, is politics, and that's changeable. There's a lot of noise associated with that signal. It's very changeable, um, and you're trying, you can often hear multiple signals at once. Again, if innovation has to compete with other agendas that are more easily understood and more clearly articulated, it's going to come second. So how do we boost the clarity around innovation within the system? 
The second factor is parity. In the private sector, there's a marketplace for ideas. Um, if you've got an idea, you can go to your employer and say, hey, this, this is the best thing since a sliced bread, um, and they might take you up on that. But if they don't, there's always a threat that you might go somewhere else, whether to set up your own business or to work for a competitor. There's that threat to uh, ideas that means they get more consideration. In the public sector, however, you're going up against all of the incumbent things. There's no threat of competition usually. So a person with an idea has to go up against all of those forces unless there's an opportunity or a particular need that's clearly understood and identified that pushes uh, that innovation through. Again, without, so how can we boost uh, the chances of innovation? How can we give it an equal seat at the table with business as usual options? The third factor we talk about is suitability. And now this is probably the trickiest one to get to grips with. But if we think about in the private sector, investment in the edge and the emergent happens. There are very strong feedback loops for the private sector about what to invest in. Again, it's not always a good thing, but it, it happens. And what works gets scaled or copied or built upon. But if we compare again to the public sector, the feedback loops tend to favour what is understood. Yet if we wait until something is really understood, we become a taker rather than a shaper. And I think that's clearly illustrated with most of uh, the experiences of government around IT. If you wait, you lose the ability to become a sophisticated consumer and your absorptive capacity, your ability to engage with this innovation and to take advantage of its options is going to be uh, lower than it could be. And if government's going to be suited to its context, it needs to invest and support the technology, infrastructure, systems and capabilities to match its context. So how can we boost the suitability of government for innovative options? The fourth factor is normality. Now in the private sector, if something makes money, it's accepted, even if it's incredibly stupid doesn't matter. It becomes part of the normal because it gets a clear feedback loop and system that says this is okay. We don't have that in the public sector. It's too often innovation is seen as an exception, as something unusual or a bit of a frolic, a bit of a, a lark. But as long as that's the case, it will be hard to make innovation part of the routine and to embed in the core workings of government. Now, each of these are quite, uh, of course, simplifications, and the reality is always more nuanced. It's a, the real world is a lot more complex than that. But hopefully that's helpful in thinking about the different structural forces at play and how they relate to innovation and why we see such differences between the private sector and public sector when it comes to innovation. Now, we're not going to be able to remove those circumstances or make the public sector like the private sector, but we can enhance and think creatively around how we can support the public sector in sending a stronger signal around innovation. So hopefully that helps provide a bit more clarity about these determinants and their manifestation at the system level. And I should note that these are interdependent. If you don't have clarity, for instance, it's going to be hard to achieve parity. Why would you give consideration to innovative options if you don't understand why innovation is important? And then why would you invest in innovation if you don't get the good options put forward? And innovation won't become normal if it's not invested in. And if it's not normal, it's going to be hard to get clarity around innovation because it's going to seem something distant and removed from the day to day. We should also note that a system is only going to perform as strong as its weakest part. And in the Canadian context, the observation I'd make was that uh, there's a strong importance around clarity. It was sort of the keystone element within the Canadian context. There's a strong demand uh, within Canada for uh, understanding whether someone has a mandate to do something, who, whether there's permission or appropriateness around 
a particular set of activities. And so therefore, it's subsequently probably the most advanced area with the most activity within the Canadian public service. Now, that's all well and good, but what does that look like in practice? For each of the determinants, we've determined some, some key action areas or points of intervention that can make these, these concepts real rather than abstract. So, for clarity, it's about is there a clear signal being sent to system actors about innovation and how it fits with other priorities? Now, if we take uh, some of these elements, for instance, actors, do they understand what innovation really means? If we look at to uh, counterparts in Denmark, there's been a lot of work there to build a shared understanding through their innovation barometer, a widespread survey that they use to talk about innovation and identify innovation activity within agencies. It gives them uh, a comparison, a bit of a benchmark by which they can talk about innovation and where it's happening. There's been a lot of effort to have agreed definitions, but also contextual understanding between different organizations and settings. In Canada, uh, what we saw was quite a divergence in views around what innovation actually means. Um, there's certainly been some activity to help with that. For instance, the Declaration on Public Sector Innovation is a great start. Uh, there's been some work around trying to uh, coalesce around some core concepts of what innovation is and what it means in the public sector context. Um, but there's probably still room to move. The second element there, do actors understand innovation in relation to other priorities and agendas? Again, if we look to overseas experiences in France here, there's a manifesto on public sector innovation, which really helps set a clear appetite and expectation around innovation and why it's important. In the Canadian context, there are things like the Declaration on Public Sector Innovation. There's the work being done at the Impact and Innovation Unit in the Impact Canada Initiative. There's some uh, sort of high level parts of the innovation agenda that are demonstrating the link of why innovation is needed and why it's important. But it's a question of whether that's as widespread across the system as it could be or should be. To take the third element, do actors understand the roles played in the innovation system? Again, if we go to Denmark, they have some really interesting work around eight innovation archetypes, ranging from the innovation tourist to the innovation evangelist uh, and missionary. Um, and it just helps uh, articulate different ways that people can, can participate in the innovation process. It's not to say that everyone should be an innovator or should be leading the charge with new ideas and so on, but it's recognizing that everyone does play some role within the innovation system and uh, process. Um, and it's help, it helps to provide people with a sense of what role they could play. In Canada, um, I think we've seen some uh, significant improvements with, in this space through some of the innovation labs that have helped people get uh, hands-on experience with innovation and get a sense for what they can do. Uh, but again, there's probably um, some room to move there. And finally, do actors see how innovation fits with the shared history and context? Again, uh, not to keep harping on about Denmark, but there they did some really interesting work around the changing the narrative about the public sector where they uh, talked about how the role of the public servant and the public service has moved from more traditional father and mother roles to that of collaborator um, and how innovation is a part of that. In Canada, I think there's again been some great efforts um, but uh, and hopefully the review can help with this. We have identified a clear timeline of how uh, the current state has been reached what were the big milestones and developments that helped shape the innovation context to really illustrate that innovation has been a part of the journey of the public service of Canada all along. Uh, it's not something foreign, it's not something alien to the public service, it's always been there. It's just about helping uh, reflect that and emphasize that and know that it is an important part of your history, uh, of the history of the Canadian civil service. 
So hopefully uh, we've uh, made some contribution to that space. And now the opportunity is for others to take advantage of that. And in the report for each of these uh, factors, we, we talk about a prompting question, something to help re reflect on whether the right level of clarity has actually been reached. And it's always going to be uh, a balancing act with this. You're never going to, to nail it. You're never going to have the perfect answer for this. It's always going to evolve as the system itself changes. But it, it's a starting point. So do the system actors that are external to government and therefore are least familiar with the inner workings and are likely to only hear one dominant narrative, do they have a clear sense of what the public service means by innovation, where it is seeking innovation and how they can contribute? Because if the people on the outside hear a consistent story around innovation from the public service, then that means there's going to be a consistent story within the public service. So that's just one way of thinking about uh, clarity, again, making it real and tangible rather than something abstract. Now for parity, um, I'm not going to run through uh, in detail for all of these, but as you've seen with clarity, the report gives some examples from uh, overseas experiences where we've identified some, some illustrations of how these different things play out um, from different country contexts. And again, no country has got this mastered. Um, so there are examples from, from uh, many different jurisdictions. Um, and then we also look in uh, at what Canada's already doing against each of these. And there is activity against all of these things. It's just a, a helping in, uh, those within the system to question, is it enough? Is this going to give us the level of clarity, parity, suitability and normality that we think we require to achieve the innovation that we need and want. But in parity, it comes down to does innovation have equal standing with other considerations when it comes to proposed courses of action? So are processes open to challenge? Can bottlenecks be circumvented? Because there will always be bottlenecks. Can allies be found for innovations? and can risk and uncertainty be navigated? For suitability, are there the capability systems and infrastructure appropriate and sufficient for the available options? So are there parts of the system that are learning from, oh, sorry, I'm, are there parts of the system that are learning from those keeping pace with external change? Where are those uh, in the public service that are already at the edge, who are already learning um, and pushing the innovation frontier? How are technologies being socialized within the public service and what are their implications? How do leaders get exposed to new technologies and what that might mean for their organizations and their context? How are new operational models being explored? And on that one, I mean, I'll give uh, my one of my favorite examples from the Canadian context, where Talent Cloud, I think, is a really exciting experiment to explore what a, a new operational model for HR might be within a public sector context. And then finally, how, uh, how is the public service keeping track of changing expectations? Because those feedback loops, understanding what citizens and the government really wants from the public service, will be really important for driving change and the appetite for change within the public service. If you've got a clear signal from outside that you're not keeping up with what's needed or wanted, then that's going to really help innovation flow. Then finally, normality. Is innovation seen as integral rather than as an occasionally accepted deviation from the norm? So are there clear behaviors around uh, supporting innovation? Most behaviors within the public service, again, tend to be around replicating and standardizing things rather than allowing for difference and divergence. Are there efforts to link innovation and regular business? Is innovation socialized and celebrated? And is it upheld and defended when inevitably there will be things that go wrong? Innovation is about doing new things where you don't have a guarantee of the answer. Experiments will fail, things will go wrong, 
is there the appetite and the ability to defend the innovation practice though when that happens um so in the report we talk about uh, each of these and where canada's at for each of these um again for most of these there are certainly some elements in place uh but the canadian public service can likely reach for more Another element to the report is that we're dealing with a dynamic system that will evolve over time. We can't really understand the public sector innovation system fully just by looking at a static snapshot. So we've introduced some scenarios to play out possibilities to better understand what's happening. We identify three scenarios in the report. We play with uh, three scenarios. The zero null hypothesis, which is a continuation of the now uh, where we see the playing out of the existing activities and what that might look like. In scenario one, we look at, well, what happens if there's an increased attention and effort to innovation? What would that look like? And in scenario two, we take a radical shift where we put innovation at the center of everything and see what that would look like. Now, these scenarios aren't intended to be prescriptive. We're not saying any of them are good or, or better or that what you should be aiming for Instead, they're used to help illustrate and to understand the tensions and trade-offs that will be faced. They're a tool to help think through whether existing efforts will get the Canadian Civil Service what it wants. Now, there's no simple answers when it comes to innovation. We can give you answers. We can tell you uh, all of the things we know. But the problem with that is that they won't be the answers that are needed. You, uh, the people within the system need to come to the answers themselves. So in some ways, this work is more a form of therapy than a review, because we're trying to reflect the system back and help those within it think about whether that's what they want to see. In addition, any answers depend upon where uh, those in the system want to get to. And that's something that's going to continually change as ambitions and appetites shift. So we need to provide a roadmap rather than specific directions about where to go. So our aim, our hope, is to make the implicit explicit. Because it's only when the abstract becomes tangible that it can be engaged with. If we keep the, the system as some sort of abstract thing, um, people might feel powerless within it. Where instead we're trying to empower people to understand that they are part of a system, that it's something they can engage with, to point out the levers or points of intervention that can be used to nudge and guide the direction or the activity of the system, um, to see themselves as a part of the system and uh, contributors to shaping that system rather than uh, being, uh, rather than the system happening to them. Now, we're, we're new at this. This was our first review, so there's certainly room for improvement on our side. Um, but we think and hope we've made a bit of a, a start on that. Having said all of that, uh, we, we did identify some suggested areas of opportunity for the different sets of actors within the system. Now, being a system, it's going to require a collective effort. And we need to recognize that everyone can play some sort of role. Now, the areas of opportunity that we spell out in the report are suggestions or conversation starters rather than those answers. We did our best to really understand the system, but it's a complex and multi-layered thing, and we will have misunderstood, missed, or mistaken things. So it's up to those in the system to take the next step, and we're hoping that these can provide that initial starting point to work from. Um, to take all of that uncertainty and reduce it down to something a bit more manageable, a bit more practical. Um, now, before I hand over to Chad to, to provide a, a couple of reflections from the Canadian side and, and what this all means, um, it's useful to also think about uh, where next with this. Uh, in the report, we include a, a suggested sort of maturity model about uh, how innovation systems might evolve. 
Now, this is extremely speculative. Um, it's uh, included as much as uh, conversation prompt uh, as anything, but it, it might help provide a reference point uh, to thinking about the system as it evolves, to thinking about, well, once you've achieved clarity, uh, it's not just about having a clear signal, it's about understanding what your aspiration for innovation actually is, and then having a clear vision of innovation and what it's for and why it matters and so on. And so that, that might be of uh, use and, and interest. There's also another part uh, of work that's come out of this, this Canada work. It's not included in the report, but it uh, was very much prompted by our experience in Canada and the conversations that we had there. And this, uh, our innovation facets model, where we try and uh, grapple with the, the multifaceted nature of public sector innovation. That when we say innovation, we're actually meaning a lot of different things and that innovation takes a number of different forms and that those different forms should be appreciated and respected for their differences. Um, and that managing them and, and supporting them, them will uh, require different strategies and different approaches. And there's more about that on our blog um, and our website. Uh, if you're interested in that. But I wanted to recognize uh, its origin story um, from the, the work with Canada. Now, before I uh, f uh, pass back to Chad, I'd like to make a special thanks to, to Chad and the rest of the team at the Impact and Innovation Unit. Um, like therapy, this work involves raking through things that sometimes you might prefer to leave undisturbed. It requires faith, it requires making yourself uh, vulnerable by showing all of the, the things that are going on. And innovation in the innovation space, you know, whatever you're doing, it's never good enough because you're learning. Um, you're not going to have it perfected. So there's always things to potentially critique and criticize. Um, so it, it does require a lot of uh, uh, willingness to put yourself out there. And the Impact and Innovation Unit uh, were very good about that. Um, with something that required a lot of faith and confidence in us and trust in us. And I, I want to um, thank them for that. And this work has been invaluable uh, for us and uh, what we've been doing. We're now using this model in Brazil, um, where we've tested the, the core elements to see what it works like in a, in a very different context. Um, and we think it holds true. Um, and hopefully this work will be of interest and use to, to many others and to governments uh, across the world. But uh, let's now switch back to, to Chad to hear about some of his perspective on this work um, and, and next steps, and then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was uh, very well done and, and uh, I think an excellent compilation of, of a great deal of work. And I certainly appreciate uh, all that you and your team have done, and I also appreciate the kind words that you mentioned at the at the the very end. Um, so I'd like to just offer maybe about three or four different reflections uh, based off of this work and based off of how I think there is uh, a way to understand uh, and socialize and uh, kind of include this in some of our work. <clears throat> excuse me, some of our work as uh, public servants in. Uh, in the Canadian context. Uh, and so the first takeaway that I will uh, I, I'll kind of mention is that we should be very proud of the work that we've been doing as public servants over the course of many, many years, many decades uh, and many generations, in, in fact. Uh, we have a very high functioning, uh, very highly professional public service. Uh, and it's very clear, uh, the, the report notes that there is a an extremely long history of innovation uh, that has been uh, kind of at the forefront of senior leaders uh, within the government as well as uh, kind of right throughout the uh, the the entire public service and so uh, so we actually should be extremely proud of this uh, from a contextual uh, perspective to note that you know we aren't starting from a position of deficit uh, we are uh, even with uh, with some of the the challenges that we do face we uh, we have a great foundation in uh, in the space of public sector innovation uh, the second thing that I will mention is uh, 
is that you know there what what is extremely clear and this came out in many of the examples uh, and the data that came out through many of the the interviews and workshops and online uh, information that was uh, was provided along the way is that uh, there's no singular uh, kind of roadmap or a series of steps that can be taken as we think about innovation inside of the the, the Canadian public service and Alex kind of talked about this in the in the context of how to even frame public sector innovation uh, inside of a government it is an incredibly uh, difficult thing to to kind of frame up and then try to explain and then try to account for all the different variables that go into it uh, and so I think as we look individually or as organizations inside of, of our bureaucracy uh, we need to recognize that uh, there is no singular uh, path towards uh, innovation. There is no series of steps that you need to follow. It's step one, then step two, step three, and so on. Uh, that we have to be quite agile. We have to be nimble. We have to, uh, uh, in, in many respects, we have to be quite intuitive about the work that we're doing, understanding that we need to uh, uh, be much more proactive in, in the way that we do some of our project management or policy development work uh, or our implementation of, uh, of our, our initiatives that we have from across uh, various perspectives in government. The third thing that I would say is this is a really key part I think of the, the, the work uh, and the outcomes of, of this work is that you know we are um, we are such a big organization uh, in the in the being the federal public service over 260,000 uh, public sector employees um, and if we think about it in the way that the report lays out uh, that that uh, public sector innovation happens across individuals it happens across organizations and it happens across systems uh, we will, without question, become frustrated uh, given the, the size and the magnitude of, of, our, um, of our organizations. Even the smallest of, of some of our departments that we work in are, uh, employ thousands of people. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, I think, a, a, an important thing to keep in mind that uh, the desire to do innovation, I think, rests in uh, a great number of public servants uh, across the country. Uh, but trying to uh, simply find a way to say, I've got the answer, this is what we need to do, is, is going to be a, a, an incredibly difficult thing to uh, really uh, 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 implement uh, across uh, across organizations so big and then across a system that is so vast and, and diverse. Uh, so keep that in mind as, as you move forward. Uh, you have, uh, as, uh, as public servants, kind of within your control, opportunities to uh, certainly uh, uh, control what you're working on and how you, uh, how you can actually undertake work in the in the context of your work responsibilities and I would encourage everybody to be as obviously as innovative as, as they possibly can in that regard and that's going to have an impact on the organizational uh, 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 I guess the organization that you work in both kind of at a small organization within a division or directorate inside of a sector if you will uh, but will also have uh, at some level an important impact on the on, on the department or the agency that you're you're working in as well. So there's this this kind of spillover effect that happens. And I think if we remember just how important or just where our roles are inside of that system, uh, that's where the opportunity for um, advancing innovation inside of our, our work as as public servants has um, has to has to look at in in kind of the the, the near term. And then the last thing that I will say, uh, which is probably not going to be a, a huge element of surprise for everyone, but I think it's worth saying, and I think it would uh, also be reflective, I think, of the work that Alex and the team have done at the OECD uh, around, uh, around this, this, uh, this discrete piece of work is, like, this is extremely hard work to do. Uh, there is not, uh, as I mentioned, there's not a roadmap being undertaken or a series of steps that you can follow around it. Uh, even Alex, I think you've mentioned uh, that the methodology in doing this analysis has, has, never, uh, has never been undertaken, so it was created a bit on the fly. Uh, and that's what I think is uh, an important takeaway as well, is that when you're doing public sector innovation, 
and doing innovation generally speaking sometimes you will not have all of the information necessary to to uh, lay out the best possible plan at that point in time to make a decision you're going to have to be building and implementing and, and enacting uh, on decisions uh, as you uh, as you go along and without question you're going to be told no you'll probably be told no uh, many many times along the way and the question really is, is how can we then take that no, turn it into a stronger uh, proposal, stronger initiative, uh, find a way to turn the no into a yes by addressing why the no is actually being, uh, being come out uh, in, a, in the form that it, that it is. Uh, and, uh, and I think those are the important takeaways uh, that, that we as, uh, as public servants working in the public sector innovation space uh, would and should probably take away from uh, from this this really good work that the OECD has done. So I'm going to hold it there, just with those kind of three or four quick reflections uh, and the practicality of it inside of our, our work as as public servants inside of uh, the Canadian context, anyway. And I know that if there are people that are on this webinar from other governments, uh, either within Canada or or around the world, uh, my sense is is that there will be uh, some sort of uh, similarity in, in some of those experiences that we uh, that we have here uh, and I certainly look forward to questions and comments uh, as uh, as the rest of the, the the agenda continues thanks Alex back to you thank you Chad um, I'm going to look to my colleague now who's going to ask the questions hey good morning or afternoon everyone uh, my name is Kevin Richmond I'm a, a innovation specialist at the the OPSI as well and a co-worker of Alex um, here running the, the technical part of the, the webinar today. Um, so thank you all for your questions. So first off, a question that came up a lot, which was, is the slide, are the slides going to be available? And uh, is the webinar recorded? The answer is yes, the webinar is recorded. Uh, we will email everyone out when it is posted. We'll put it on our YouTube channel. Uh, and then we will make the slides available as well. Um, so with that, we did get a, a lot of questions, so I tried to group them as, as similarly as possible. Uh, so we'll start with the, the question specifically focusing on Canada at first, because Chad may be interested in, in giving some thoughts on those as well. Uh, so the first question is, um, in order to make the current government accountable for its investments in innovation, did your analysis analysis explore if there is a strategy to translate the innovation outcome and efforts into added value for its citizens. Any suggestions on how to make the innovation efforts more transparent and more clearly articulated? And how do you create buy-in from citizens around the investments done in government innovation strategy? Uh, a small question then. Um, so uh, one of the fundamental challenges with innovation is that it's hard to measure. Uh, because you're doing something that hasn't been done before, and therefore you don't have uh, the right uh, standards or uh, performance targets or things that you can easily say, well, yes, this has done that. Sometimes innovation is about doing things in completely new ways, and that means the old set standards, the old targets uh, and performance metrics might not be the right ones. Um, so, A, innovation and measurement and proving impact is very, very hard. Uh, I'm going to handball to Chad on this, though, because it's uh, certainly been a focus area of uh, the unit. Um, I'll just say that, no, we didn't really dive into that. It was more about trying to understand whether innovation is happening at the level wanted and needed, and therefore uh, what could be done to support that. Um, but I'm, I'm going hand, uh, hand to handball to Chad for the, the impact side. Thank you, Alex. And it is a uh, very, very important question, uh, and it's essentially one of the uh, one of the really strong tenors uh, from my perspective that the uh, the current government has uh, has put in place in Canada around its results and delivery agenda, where there is a really important focus on the achievement of results. Uh, not on the uh, description of or cataloging of the activities or processes that are uh, associated with it. So what I would say around that question, there's probably two or three components to it. The first is uh, that we, uh, we oftentimes do look at 
describing uh, the importance or the impact of our work through process or through activities uh, or through the amount of funding, for example, that may be uh, provided to a, a particular initiative. I would encourage uh, all of us to really be thinking about what the actual outcome is. Uh, and in the, in the policy space or the programmatic space that you work in, uh, I think it is really critical to think about, you know, how you can have impact X on population Y, uh, which results in, uh, you know, a better outcome for, uh, for that population that you're, you're looking to, to improve the outcome on. It's a very big change in how we oftentimes think about impact. Uh, but I think if we start to shift that focus around those activity-based uh, initiatives into the outcomes-based side of things, we will uh, we will start to uh, change the narrative uh, around some of this. Second thing I would say is, uh, as part of this work, particularly particularly where we may not know all of the component pieces, as Alex referenced, is uh, is a suggestion to actually work a bit out in the open. Uh, and so a bit of a taking a, a bit of an open by default approach where uh, if you are actively communicating what you think will happen as a result of some of the work that you're doing, uh, if you publish that information on your, your website that, uh, that kind of encapsulates some of the work that you're doing or if you are public in, uh, in your dialogue around how you're looking to address the question of impact, uh, that is um, that is a it's, number one. It's a very different approach, but number two, it's a it's an approach that I think is much more open and engaging uh, to the people that will be uh, will be part of your your stakeholder group or, around some of it. Uh, and so there's no question then around uh, what you're trying to do because you've been working uh, much more in the open than uh, than what has normally been done. And then the third thing that I would say is uh, is that. Whenever you're talking about impact, when you're, whenever you're talking about performance measurement, I think there is a, a critical piece that we overlook around that uh, that uh, element of of our uh, of our of our work as bureaucrats. Uh, in that it's it's an evergreen process. We can state at the outset of our work that we expect you know outcome A or outcome B to take uh, to be what we. Uh, achieve at the end of the day, but oftentimes those are five years down the road. Uh, and my my intuition on this suggests that if we are implementing based on the objective of achieving outcome A or outcome B, we should be much more proactive in assessing the data, in assessing the uh, the 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 implementation successes, and uh, in taking stock of whether we're on track towards achieving those along the way. And what we actually might find is that outcome A and outcome B might be, actually be uh, not appropriate in the context of what we're finding through some of the early interactions of in, in implementation, and that it's really outcome C that might come out uh, as the preferred or desired outcome. Again, if you're operating in the open around some of that, uh, this is a much easier uh, process to to manage uh, from a from a, a stakeholder management or from a partnership management perspective, uh, and uh, and it's also uh, showing a real strong element of sophistication in our implementation, in our data analysis, and in our ability to be, to be agile and nimble in that implementation. All right. So the next question is. Uh, about culture. So the risk averse organizational culture in the Canadian public service is often cited as a major barrier to innovation. Uh, any observations on this as well as any suggestions for how to quickly shift this endemic belief in the system? So one of the interesting things about working at the OECD is we get to go to different countries and look at different contexts. Um, and I can say with authority that yes, there's a risk aversion within the Canadian civil service. But I, if I take the example of the Brazil public service, I can say there's risk aversion there. Uh, in a context where individual public servants can be held accountable for things uh, to the extent that you know they can be uh, punished uh, at an individual level for, for things, uh, which is a, a much more severe risk environment than uh, I'm used to from the Australian context or what's uh, seen in Canada, perhaps. So the inside out of that for me is that uh, humans habituate to whatever the environment is. We will, the public service is always going to be risk averse. Uh, 
The question then is not how do you uh, magically solve that, but how do you balance it? How do you increase uh, how do you uh, increase the risk of not innovating? How do you make that more tangible? How do you make that clearer and more felt so that the risks of innovating can be put into context, that they can be seen uh, and judged as whether they're appropriate or not? Now, that's hard, but I think one of the, the really exciting things that's happening in the Canadian context with the experimentation direction um, and commitment is that you have a, there a structural force to say, you must do some experimenting. Um, and that takes away some of that risk for people because it, it says uh, experimenting is okay and is expected. Um, so automatically some of the, the risk is, is dealt with. So I think that's the direction that we should come at this, uh, come at this from, is trying to balance those risks rather than pretending that we can ever remove them because uh, the public sector has particular incentives and feedback loops and structures that mean we will always be conscious of risk. How can we just make sure that that risk is held in, in context and, and is seen in proportion to the reality of it and we, uh, that we acknowledge the risks of not innovating? Um, but I'll pass to Chad for any additional thoughts. Thank you, Alex. I'm going to add three things uh, to, to that question. Uh, Alex is 100% right that we have an opportunity around the experimentation uh, mandate commitment that uh, uh, is, uh, is kind of uh, pushing the, um, the opportunity for more uh, innovation inside of government. What I'll also draw your attention to is uh, clerks and cabinet secretaries across federal, provincial, and territorial governments back in uh, November 2016 um, uh, published what's called the FPT Declaration on Public Sector Innovation. If you have not seen that, I would highly recommend that you go uh, and check it out. It's on our Impact and Innovation Unit website. It essentially provides what I would call the, the broad-based uh, coverage that's required for uh, for public servants to do their jobs in different ways. That's looking at better engagement, that's looking at data-driven outcome approaches, that's looking at prize challenge approaches, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, that, that, that document in and of itself what is what I would say provides every single public servant, regardless of what you're doing, uh, some tacit approval to go off and, and explore and do things differently. Obviously, you're working within a system uh, that requires checks and balances and, uh, and, and the need to uh, get approvals through different, uh, different sides of, uh, of that, that process. But the fact is, is uh, if we do not kind of take advantage at uh, the grassroots level of doing things differently uh, and taking advantage of the, that, uh, that kind of space that the FPT declaration uh, carves out, then I think, uh, then I think we have a we aren't we aren't doing ourselves a service uh, uh, from an innovation perspective uh, uh, at the outset. The second thing that I would say is, uh, uh, and this gets to the context of risk, the assessment of risk. And I think there is it's an important point to actually look at what risk actually means. And if you if you actually frame uh, things around outcomes. So rather than looking at activity-based uh, initiatives that take place inside of our, our, uh, our either our policy development program implementation uh, or other sorts of work that we're doing, uh, we, we focus on those activities, but we don't know if those activities actually lead to an objective or an outcome that we're trying to achieve. Uh, if we pay on outcomes, uh, then we actually know what we're what we're actually getting at the end of the day, and if the outcome isn't reached, we don't pay. And so I would argue that from a risk perspective, that's actually a much better risk to take on uh, from a public policy perspective, from a public service perspective, and from a Canadian taxpayer perspective, is to pay when the outcome is achieved, not when the activities are completed, but we don't know if those activities actually achieve something. Uh, so let's not try to conflate the issue of risk overall. Uh, let's actually debate what that risk actually is. And if we can prove that we're hitting the outcome, there should be less risk inside of the system uh, at an overall level. And the last thing I would say uh, from a kind of a pure like 
uh, systems perspective uh, is the system oftentimes operates by convention and not so much as uh, by what an original or uh, kind of a foundational policy or a guidance or uh, uh, some sort of uh, kind of approval document would actually allow for. So I, I would recommend if you're getting pushback inside of your area of work around uh, this is too risky, uh, this is not within the scope of the policy, et cetera, et cetera, go back to those foundational documents. My sense is, is that in most cases, the foundational documents like a foundational policy or guidelines or uh, or some sort of guidance around uh, interpretation of policies provide for a tremendous amount of flexibility. Uh, through the operationalization of those, those policies, we end up squeezing out all of the flexibility that those uh, guidelines and policies were supposed to actually have. And now we need to go back and revisit those. So I would, I would just, as a rule of thumb, go back and, uh, and look at some of those uh, kind of foundational documents that should provide enough flexibility to do these things without having to go back to cabinet, go back to treasury board, seek a special exemption from senior management or anything like that. My sense is that there's enough there in most cases, and we should be pushing to get people to explain why we can't do it when the flexibility is there versus defaulting to that customized norm of, of, uh, of risk aversion and operation that uh, automatically prevents it. All right, so for the, the sake of time, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, I want to make sure that, that we balance and ask some questions about the model because there were, there were a decent bit of questions regarding the model as well. Um, and if we have time, we'll, we'll finish up some of the, the Canadian questions. Um, but uh, one of the questions was, any thoughts about the balance between grassroots efforts and top-down direction for innovation, um, especially in regards to normality? What is that sweet spot? So. Um, that's probably something that we uh, I have explored or are exploring more within our innovation facets model, that you need a, a balance between top down and, and bottom up, uh, the more adaptive innovation. Uh, in a, a large complex uh, system, in a, in a setting where there's a lot of change going on, your ability to command and control all of the right responses uh, is uh, very limited. Um, you need people being open to uh, the changes that are occurring at the edge, uh, being aware of them and, and being able to respond. Um, in, a, in a big changeable world, the, uh, the need for innovation might strike anywhere and thus everyone has to have some capacity to engage with it um, and be ready for it, uh, to play a role. So it is, it is very hard to, to say look like though. I don't think I've seen it uh, uh, anywhere myself. I think there are there are countries such as Denmark which are much more decentralized um, and there's a lot more empowerment of uh, other levels of government um, and and so on. Um, but I, I don't think anyone's uh, mastered this yet. Uh, I do, do think, I mean, one of the issues that I see again and again, though, in the public sector setting is that um, quite often we as public servants will need, will feel like we need to be given permission, when actually that permission has probably already been given. Um, innovation is a bit scary, uh, a bit daunting, and so we can often just want a bit of reassurance and hand-holding. Um, when leaders don't necessarily have that time, they may think they've already given the permission for you to, to go out and do things. So sometimes I think it's incumbent on uh, uh, public servants to think about, well, what is their remit for change already? And to pursue that uh, to the extent that they've already got it. Um, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a hard one and it's something uh, I think we need to do more thinking about and, and more investigation. So the next question um, is purely about the model, which is just you, there are four areas of each element um, and is that a maturity model? Uh, so we we did identify a, a more significant maturity model in terms of the, the different levels that 
uh, might exist for an innovation system, noting, uh, of course, the fact that we've only seen one level of those innovation systems, so the others are entirely made up. Um, I think uh, maybe as we do more of these, we will get uh, studies, we will get a better sense of what um, maturity and sophistication looks like within each of those sub-activities, uh, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, for some of these things around suitability uh, or normality, I would have trouble telling you what a mature and sophisticated system looks like or should look like, uh, because I just don't know yet. Um, but hopefully each of those uh, interventions are things where they're tangible and real enough that people should be able to feel that they know when they're being achieved or reached. Um, but again, it's an area I think we'll, we'll have to just see over time. So this is a question both a, a little bit about the model and innovation systems as well as uh, Canada and, and their responses to this. So um, disruptive change uh, such as linked to emergent technologies like blockchain um, that have the possibility to address global societal challenges poses new policy challenges for government, um, not least in enforcing government to rethink their role in the innovation system. So what role is the public sector in Canada taking in response to disruptive change? Um, and uh, more, more generally, like what governance mechanisms are successful in facilitating innovation in response to disruptive change? So to tackle the second part of the question, uh, that's an area of work that we at uh, the observatory are, are sort of undertaking now. Um, the What does an anticipatory innovation governance system look like? What does it really look like when governments are open to those really emergent disruptive shifts and able to engage with them and uh, start uh, actively shaping how those technologies play out rather than waiting and seeing um, and then engaging. I think uh, we're all now in ve very well aware of uh, the risks to government of allowing some of these disruptive technologies to play out uh, and then intervening as we're seeing with uh, social media. Um, uh, but it's again not an area that I think uh, any government has really mastered. The, the types of agencies where we see this usually best done are those where the, the costs of being surprised are very well understood. So in defence, in uh, medicine, in uh, animal health sort of and uh, um, uh, crop production, you know, you've got very, very real consequences to being surprised. And therefore, those agencies are generally well attuned to uh, the emergent and the disruptive and what that might mean. Uh, I don't think the same can be said of much of the rest of, of government, although there are always exceptions. On the Canadian uh, specifically, on the Canadian context specifically, I'll uh, pass to Chad to make some comments. Thanks, Alex. Uh, this this issue of disruptive technology is going to be a major driver of. Uh, of work within the, the public service uh, for the foreseeable future. I don't think there's any way to get around it. And the question is not whether we will uh, learn how to adopt and apply the, the this type of technology in our work. The question is, is when are we going to do it and how quickly is it going to happen? Uh, on Within the Canadian context, I'd mention a couple of things. Um, the first is that uh, uh, we have a deputy minister committee that's focused on, it's called the Deputy Minister Task Force on Public Sector Innovation. It has a mandate to, to really explore two things. The first is around core systems transformation, uh, looking at things like programming, uh, grants and contributions programming, human resources procurement, and things like that. The second piece of uh, their, their mandate is around uh, experimenting with disruptive technologies like AI and blockchain and those sorts of things uh, to learn lessons on how we can essentially, um, uh, I guess, adapt and adopt those technologies into our, our government operations uh, in a way that will help us to become uh, smarter, uh, a bit more risk savvy, I would say at the end of the day, and probably uh, become much more efficient in, in, in the way that we're doing some of our, our work. 
And so uh, the, the, the key aspect, I think, on this is, uh, is that in a Canadian context anyway, we have a, we have a deputy level committee that is uh, mandated to look at how some of those disruptive technologies can be uh, uh, both understood inside of a, of a, of a uh, public service, uh, kind of writ large. And then the second piece is we have some discrete pieces of work that are being undertaken. Uh, by uh, by departments in collaboration with our our government of Canada entrepreneurs uh, who are uh, sitting at the at the table as well with uh, with deputy ministers as full members of the of the DM task force, and uh, and some of the in, the work that they are undertaking is quite interesting. Uh, I just point out a couple of quick examples is. You know they have uh, they've been experimenting around digital identity and how uh, how blockchain technology it can play a role in digital identity management and then the question is is how what that actually means for uh, how citizens interact with the federal government through a digital uh, a single digital identity that is uh, both secure. Uh, and uh, and user friendly. Second thing, a second example would be around how uh, how advances in artificial intelligence might be able to help with uh, with translation services. So Canada being uh, uh, a bilingual com uh, country, uh, we have an obligation to be uh, providing. Uh, our documentation and our services in in, uh, in both official languages. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of translation uh, between English and French and French and English. Uh, and the question is, is can artificial intelligence play a role in uh, becoming a, a more effective and efficient way of doing that translation. Uh, now, I would not recommend for one second that we just go ahead and, and uh, implement a solution across the entire translation uh, system inside of the government. Uh, that would probably not be the, the wisest of decisions to make, but, uh, but doing it in a, on a small scale, testing it out, learning from it, communicating about it, and redoing it is, is that iterative, agile approach that, that I uh, had referenced earlier on. The last thing I will just say on, on this point uh, around disruptive technology is some key foundational pieces absolutely need to be in place around it. Uh, probably uh, the most important uh, or certainly one of the most important pieces around it is is how we collect and use data within the, the federal architecture uh, uh, for, uh, for for being able to then apply these disruptive technologies into it. And I think that the, uh, the key aspect around this is that uh, the Government of Canada now has a, uh, a data strategy that was released about a week or week and a half ago uh, as well and I would encourage uh, anybody who's interested to kind of take a look at that because it's a foundational element of how we can then uh, move into much more um, in a much more uh, informed way into the space of, of the utilization of disruptive technologies. So we have time for, for probably two more questions. So we got uh, four or five questions around the clay layer. Um, specifically, how do you overcome it in regards to innovation and experimentation? Um, and someone also had mentioned, uh, is there a possible solution around uh, and uh, a potential barrier right now that there's no central agency responsible for innovation where federal employees uh, coming from the government uh, would be able to share ideas and is that uh, a potential solution for helping with the clay layer and what other things have we seen? Um, so uh, I, I think the, the frustration with uh, middle management uh, is universal. Um, it's the nature of bureaucratic organizations and hierarchical organizations. Um, it's certainly an issue that came across in Australia and I've heard complain about uh, everywhere which seems to suggest that it's a, a structural issue rather than a contextual issue. So um, that's why in uh, the, uh, the things where we talk about uh, parity, the sub-intervention sort of areas we talk about that, you know, can bottlenecks be circumvented? Because uh, middle management plays an essential role in any organization of filtering uh, both the information going up and the information coming from the top down. Um, sometimes they're just not going to be in a position where they can uh, accept or absorb these ideas. So how can we create forums where people can uh, s circulate and share and develop their ideas uh, 
um, to a more sophisticated level before it requires uh, management attention and decision making. Um, and that's the same with, you know, can allies be found? Um, and I think uh, a platform like GC Connects and GC Collab are really great examples of forums where, you know, if used right, people can uh, find those ally allies and uh, develop those ideas uh, more to a higher level before they need government, uh, before they need managerial attention uh, and so on. Um, but uh, Chad, do you want to throw in a quick comment about that? Thanks, Alex. I think much of what I was talking about with respect to the risk aversion question still applies to, to this question about the clay layer. Um, the only point I would add on to this uh, is, and this is a bit of a nod, I think, to the OECD and, and some of the work they've done around skills uh, for kind of a, a, an agile, kind of modern, innovative 21st century public service. There's one of those skills that's around storytelling. Um, and what is, I think, important to, uh, to do uh, as, as public servants is be able to tell your story uh, from the perspective of what is going to get the, the, the middle management sector inside of government uh, engaged. Uh, and then tell that story that's going to actually hit on where those primary areas of concern actually are. If it's around risk, you need to tell that story from a risk aversion perspective. If the if it's around communications, you need to tell it from a communications perspective. If it's around policy authorities uh, or around engagement or around outcomes, you need to be able to shift your story be true to its kind of foundation, but shift your story into a, a way that is going to uh, resonate with those uh, those different audiences along the way. I can tell you without question that the way that I approach the briefing of an ADM is different than how we approach doing it with a deputy uh, in certain situations where I brief the clerk here. That is also a different strategy as well as when you uh, start to brief minister uh, ministers or ministerial staff. You have to be able to tell that story in a way that is going to uh, address some of those things that are uh, front of mind uh, of of, uh, of those target audiences, and I think that that's that that component of storytelling uh, that can help address uh, the the I guess the concerns or the risk or the, the those kind of uh, important or difficult points to kind of get through to uh, to those uh, approval processes along the way. So the last question that we have time for, and I'll change it up and ask Chad to go first this time. <laughs> um, what aspects of the findings may be applicable to other countries? Well, that's a, that is a great question. I, I think that uh, if I could give one piece of advice around this to, to other countries, uh, it would be that the, uh, the framework that the OECD has put together around uh, essentially the assessment of what's happening in Canada uh, is a great starting point uh, to, um, to assess uh, your own country against. Uh, and that it probably can and should uh, shift and change along some of the important variables that, uh, that the OECD has kind of brought to surface uh, around some of this. Uh, but it will, uh, it will, I think, certainly still fall within the rubric of kind of the four key pillars that have, uh, have been identified and surfaced through through this uh, this report. Uh, the the key aspect, though, I think, at the end of the day, is uh, it almost defaults back to what I said almost at the very beginning uh, around. There's no single roadmap for how to make this work. It's very contextual, uh, and uh, and if there is a framework that's in place, or there is now anyway through through this work. Work, the uh, the applicability of that framework, the ability to shift that framework, I think, has to be taken into account uh, in other countries uh, in order to really get a, a, a better understanding of the working environment and of the uh, the way that that public service actually operates. So please take it take it up, use it as a framework. It is uh, what I would call a very good public good that other countries can use as a uh, uh, as a framework for some of the, the assessment of their innovation systems inside of government, but walk into it knowing that uh, the reality of the Canadian context is, is going to be different uh, in, in other countries uh, and be ready and aware to adapt, uh, adapt to those, those realities along the way.
Um, I'll just add to that that I think, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, we're, we're testing this in the Brazil context. We're seeing a lot of resonance uh, with, with the work uh, there. I think, you know, the advantage of the Canadian work was that we, we really dove deep to understand those fundamental drivers of innovation activity. And I think those are, are constant. Um, it's those nuances that, that Chad was talking about that will change. Um, uh, but having said that, I mean, I, I know from my own context, there's a lot of resonance uh, with some things from the Australian Public Service. Um, so, and I, uh, I hope and the intent was uh, that this should be of use to, to people from uh, any country. Um, so we'll uh, wrap up there. Uh, again, I just want to thank you again, Chad, for your time and for um, for for the uh, helping partner with us on this work. Um, it was great. Um, uh, we will send an email uh, to participants with the slides and the recording, and a link to the report and the summary document. Um, and there's some background information also you can access on our, our website. Um, if you've got further questions, please uh, feel free to uh, contact us at uh, uh, opsi at oecd.org. I'm happy to, to answer those as well. Um, otherwise, thank you for joining us and I uh, hope you have a good day. Cheers. <laughs>